Your work is a life to all who hear and obey. Your word endures forever. Right. Today's passage is 1 Corinthians 7, 17 to 24, which can be found on page 1149. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned them. Just as God has called them, this is the rule I lay down in all churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised, um, should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who is a slave and called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who is free when God is called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. To keep that uh, passage uh, open, um, we we'll think about that together. Let me just uh, lead us in a prayer once again. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word, which is living and active. Um, which pierces to joint and marrow, um, and which uh, does that in our lives. Uh, and we pray this morning that your word would do its work in our hearts, and that your spirit would be taking that word and applying it to our minds and transforming our lives by it. pray that these words might be a comfort and an encouragement, but also a challenge and possibly a rebuke for some. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if only I had. You ever said that? No. If only, if only uh, we had. Is that something you ever, have ever thought? No, if only I had, or what have I done? Uh, what have we done? If only you look at the the circumstances of your life and you wonder how did I end up here? And so you look back. If only um, I had moved to when I had the opportunity. If only I, I hadn't moved to when we had the opportunity. If only I had friends, or if only I had those types of friends, if, if only I'd worked harder at school, if only I hadn't uh, got ill, if, if only. And we, can, we can have those thoughts, uh, can't we? And sometimes those thoughts, uh, they, don't, they don't really matter, do they? Kind of, of little concern. So if only I hadn't played with my toys when I was a child and kept them in a box, I could have sold them for loads of money now. Um, it doesn't really make any difference, does it? Um, you don't really affect your life, you don't really think about those things a uh, lot. But sometimes those, those if-onlys, it really do affect how you think about life and how you actually live life. Uh, the if-onlys can stop you living the Christian life. They can put your life on hold. It causes you to stop serving um, in the way in which you might be able to serve. Or you might be thinking, well, if only that particular thing happens, then I will be able to serve. So you look forward to think, if only that happens, then I'll begin to serve. Then I'll be able to live the Christian life. Then I'll be a real and good Christian. And if I had a different job, if only I had a different job, I would be able to do so much more at church. If only I had a different in marriage situation, I would, I would be able to serve much better. If only. You might fill, fill the blank for, for yourself. If only fill the blank, then I'd be able to be a better Christian. If only. And that's the kind of thing I think this passage is going to help us with. Those if only thoughts. Particularly as they relate to how we live the Christian life. And how we think about our status as a Christian. Uh, these verses um, that we're looking at this morning, they come right in the middle of uh, chapter 7 of uh, 1 Corinthians. Which, as I um, thought about seeing that this week, well, that's a pretty obvious uh, thing to see, that these verses are right in the middle. But you remember, we've been looking at chapters 5 to 7 of 1 Corinthians over these weeks. And they've all been about fleeing sexual immorality, so, so getting rid of uh, sexual immorality on glorifying God or honouring God with our bodies. 
In chapter 7, it's particularly about how to honour God with your body, how we can live a life to glorify God. In chapter 7, I've been uh, particularly thinking about how we do that in the realm of sexuality, um, about marriage and about singleness. So uh, the first half that we've looked at has talked a lot about um, marriage. And what we'll look at next week when Adam preaches focuses mainly on singleness. Then right in the middle, you've got this little section, which when you first look at it, you think, well, Paul is just making a big digression. He's, he's, he's talking about something completely different. It's a, a digression in the flow of the argument. Paul introduces the, the topics of circumcision and the topic of uh, slavery. And some people think that Paul is just making uh, a digression here. And yet these verses right at the heart of this uh, chapter are actually, I think, the key to understanding the whole of the chapter. Uh, they are very relevant to the topic of marriage and singleness. They're to obviously relevant to the topic of circumcision and slavery. But what Paul does in, the, in these verses, he introduces a principle which will help us think about our Christian life, about how we live it out, about how we think about our relationship uh, to God. And he uses um, circumcision and slavery as uh, worked examples of that. Uh, principle. Principle which my, uh, applies to marriage and singleness, but will apply to every situation of life. And you can see the principle, it comes uh, three times in these uh, short verses. So verse 17. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as the Lord called them. Or verse 20. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. So verse 24. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. The point is this. To live for Jesus, to be a, a good Christian, if you like, you don't need to be anywhere else other than you are right now. Your circumstance of life right now is where you are able to live for Jesus. And so the first point this morning is that live where you are. Now I think this is such an important thing uh, to say, and it seems such an obvious thing to say as well in many ways. But it's important to say that your circumstance of life, your station of life, has no bearing on whether you can live for Jesus. It has no bearing on your standing before Jesus. You see, this is, these verses are about living for Jesus, living the Christian life, living before Jesus. You see in verse 17, nevertheless, each person should live as a believer. Literally, the word for live there is to, to walk around with that kind of sense of having your walk of life you can live your Christian life in whatever circumstance of life you are in right now. Now, when you became a Christian, it wasn't because you met a particular standard, whether that was a moral standard or a social standard or a racial standard. But you were called to be a Christian where you were. The state you are in didn't matter. You see, that's what Paul is saying here. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has signed them, just as God has called them. See in verse 20, each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. See in verse 24. So maybe when you became a Christian, you were, you were poor and had no money. Maybe you were called to live as a Christian, as a poor person. And you can live as a Christian in that state. You, you might have been called a Christian, you thought, well, I had no status in life. You were called as a Christian and can live as a Christian in that state. You might be rich and with a busy job when you became a Christian, you can live as a Christian in that state. You might have been married when you became a Christian, you can live as a Christian in that state. You might have been single when you were a Christian, you can live as a Christian like that. So think back to where we started with the if-onlys. 
And we think, if only I had moved, then I'd be able to serve God better. Paul's saying here, you can serve God where you are. If only I hadn't moved, then I'd be able to serve God better. Paul is saying, well, you can serve God right here, right now. The point Paul is, is making is, you can serve God right now, wherever you are, wherever you're living, whatever state of life you have. You might say, if only I had, had friends, or if I had different friends, I would be able to serve God better. Paul is saying, you can serve God with the friends you have now. You can serve God with the, the people around you, even if you find it hard. This is the place that God has placed you for the time being. And so serve God here. You might think, if, if only I hadn't got ill, if I wasn't ill, then I would be able to serve God. Then I would really be able to live the Christian life. Then I would be a real Christian. But God is assigned where you are now. And so live as a Christian in that place. If you could have been called as a Christian in those states, you can live as a Christian in those states. And look to verse 17. Paul's Paul's not making something up here that's very specific to the Corinthian situation. You see verse 17? Nevertheless, each person should live with the believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. This is, this is normal Christian life, normal Christian teaching. And Paul applies it or, or works it out with two examples. First, with regards to circumcision. So, verse 18. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not become circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. <clears throat> The, Paul's, the example Paul chooses here, the same with slavery in a way, they may feel a little bit distant to us. It's not something we, we think about in relation to our Christian life regularly. However, it was one of the biggest issues in the early church. And the reason was, was that circumcision was one of the biggest dividing, was the biggest dividing line between the Jew and the Gentiles. It marked you out as a Jew and not a Gentile. And if it marked you out as a Jew, you were, you were separate. You were God's special people. You were on the inside track, if you like. It marked you out. And so for Paul, who had grown up in a very uh, Jewish, religious environment, someone who was a, a Pharisee, zealous for God's law, <clears throat> to see what he does in verses 18 and 19 is extraordinary. He says... Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. That marker which marked you out as God's man was nothing. It had no bearing or effect on how you could live the Christian life now. Paul says that category distinction is meaningless. For the person who's become a Christian and is uncircumcised, it doesn't matter. You can serve God in that situation. Serve God in the situation you find yourself right now. Do you see, in, a, in just a very few words, Paul radically demolishes a fundamental category distinction. I don't think we've really got anything which quite equates to that circumcision, uncircumcision divide in our lives. There's no real racial or religious marker which marks you out in that way as a, a better or a worse Christian. But I do wonder whether for us it's sometimes whether we grew up in a Christian home or not. Now more than one occasion I've had conversations with people who, who in the course of the conversation say something like this, oh, of course I didn't grow up in a Christian home. What they mean is, I think, I'll never be able to serve God like someone who did grow up in a Christian home. Or they imply that they are missing something as a Christian. But it's easy to do something, isn't it? We're missing something as a Christian. Some marker. 
But you know, that's just God's word. I was trying to think of a word to use to see how bad that was. And the best one I could come up with is God's word, which is a great word, isn't it? It's God's word to think that some kind of external mark will make you a better or worse Christian. You can live as a Christian right now, wherever you are, whether you've got tattoos on your nail and your knuckles or not. You can live as a Christian right now. Your status before God, your ability to live as a Christian, has nothing to do with your family descent or your religious markers. It's, all, it's got all to do with what God has done for you and living for him now. It's about, as Paul says in verse 19, keeping God's commands. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Living with God as your king, your ultimate authority, following his commands for life and seeking to live out the life that he has shown us in his word. And that's a long-term process. When we get to know God more and more over time, and he will change us and transform us over time. But you can start right now, and you can live it out right now. The second example concerns uh, social status. It's about slavery. You see verse 21? Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, then do so. Now, as with uh, circumcision, I think this is a, a statement far from our um, current cultural climate. In fact, I think, I don't think I would be wrong in saying we're quite troubled by statements like this, aren't we? It seems, just on a very cursory reading, which is not true actually, that Paul is endorsing slavery. And when we think of slavery, do we not think of kind of 18th century, the slave trade, the appalling a slave trade where people were uh, men and women and children were kidnapped and taken to another place and viewed merely as property to be used and abused as the property owner determined. It was appalling, wasn't it? The Bible itself condemns that, both in the New Testament and the Old Testament. And so 1, Corinth, 1 Timothy verses uh, 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, Paul lists a lot of uh, lawbreakers and says the law is for lawbreakers. And included in the list of lawbreakers, the ungodly, is slave traders. Now, the Bible condemns what happened back in the 18th century. But we, when we think of slavery, that's what we think about, isn't it? We think about that appalling slave trade and the effects which last even to this day. But when we think of that, we have to recognise that that is not the same as slavery in Roman times or pre-Roman times. Of course, there were similarities with what were happening. And, and the same as in the 18th century, it was an imperialistic kind of action. It was about one person having control over another, and over people being viewed as property. But there were, there were differences as well. One of the big differences was in Roman slavery was it was not rooted at all in race, like it was in the 18th century. Anybody could and did become slaves. Now, I'm not an expert, and, there, and there's, there's a lot more uh, to say about that, I'm sure, um, but I'm happy to have some more conversations after. But I think as we read this here, when, uh, where you're a slave, when you're called, we have to realise that a large proportion of the early church were slaves. And it wasn't until a few centuries later that Christians began to have positions where they could influence what was happening with regards to people's social status. And when they did begin to have that, they started to do things, and they built on what they learned in the Bible. And so one person I was uh, reading uh, this week was uh, reported about uh, Augustine in the 5th century. He wrote about uh, churches at the time who were buying slaves from slave traders to free them. So, so the churches were becoming almost uh, bankrupt, he writes, because they were spending so much money to free slaves. But what do you do in a situation when, when you are a slave? When you're in a, a society that slavery is accepted and you are considered the lowest of the low, in a place that no one wants to be, considered by many people to be less of a person. What does Paul say? Verse 21, 
Don't let it trouble you. Don't let it bother you. Now, he's not saying that in the sense of saying, slavery is good, so don't let it worry you. No, he says, if you can get your freedom, do so. He knows it's not a good thing. No, he's saying, don't let it trouble you, in that he's saying, you can live as a Christian as a slave. It might not be the position you want to be in. You might want to do nothing about it, but you can live as a Christian there. You are valued by your Heavenly Father. And so a slave shouldn't worry about their status of life, but should get on with serving and living as a Christian in that sphere. That's quite a remarkable thing to say, isn't it? The Paul does go on to say that if you're able to change, then do so. So don't let it trouble you. If you can gain your freedom, do so. It's a, it's a command, do so. There's no absolute prohibition here in changing your state. If you can gain freedom, do so. I'll say more about that in a moment. But can you see that becoming a Christian radically alters your perspective, even for a slave? Look at what Paul says in verse 22. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. Now, in a way, Paul is, Paul is getting us here to, to think about ourselves, about our lives. And you might think about yourself in different ways, depending on where you are as a Christian. Now, if you were a slave when you were called, the amazing truth, can you imagine what this must be like for a slave to hear? You are free, the Lord's freed person. You're owned in this life. But what an amazing joy to know that the, the creator of the whole universe, the king of the world, the one who's in control of all things, he thinks you are his freed person. Your life now might be slavery, but the trajectory of life would be freedom in all its fullness. Of course, you can probably apply it as well to our lives, where we were all slaves to sin, and Jesus frees us. But for somebody who's in slavery, to be told that the, the king of the universe, the emperor of all, considers you his freed person, of great value, that's a great comfort and encouragement, isn't it? It gives you a help to think, I can live my life, even with all the restrictions that it has, this situation has brought on me. Because I am valuable to the God of the universe. But you see, he goes on, that the one who is free, the one who has resources, the one who, I guess in our world, who's, who's rich and when they became a Christian, will... Paul says, you need to think of yourselves as Christ's slave. You are owned by the, unit, the king of the universe. You might have thought before you became a Christian that you were in charge of your uh, life. That you were the master of your own destiny. You were the, the captain of your ship, determining where it was going to go. And you come to realize that Jesus is the king. He is the ruler over all things. And he died to save you from your sin. And as you submit to him and receive his forgiveness, you become a slave. And it's the best thing that can happen because Jesus is ever kind, ever gracious, ever generous. And to be his slave is a joy. You see how Jesus radically changes how we view our worth before God and our usefulness to his kingdom. You are radically free but radically owned. And so live the Christian life where you are. Now there's, my mind has been kind of going round in a circle thinking about all the different ways of supplies to speak. There seems to be, to me, to be a whole load of ways of supplies uh, to us. And there's more ways in which we can probably tease out. I'll be trying to give a few thoughts on application now and how it might apply to us. I've done a little bit as we've gone through. I really hope this might spark discussion uh, between you, have a discussion afterwards over uh, tea and coffee and hot crust buns, the Dead Sea. Um, and so have a discussion, have a discussion in growth groups as well um, and think about how it applies to us. But firstly, what Paul is saying here is that your status of life doesn't determine 
whether you're valued by God or whether you can serve God. And so don't change. Which seems a little strong, doesn't it? But it's what Paul says in verse 20. These persons should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. It's the same point he makes in verse 24. But we need to see it's not an absolute prohibition on changing. No, he's showing that if a slave uh, could become free, then they should. So how do you, you're kind of holding those uh, two things together. Don't change, but if you can change, then, then do. That's what's going on. How do you kind of hold those uh, things uh, together? I think, as I've kind of thought about it, I think it maybe applies to something like that. Now, if you were a slave, you could pray to God of the universe, who sees you as a free person, for your freedom. You could, you could work to find your freedom. That's, that would be okay to do. Or to apply that to the subject of the, the chapter, which is married and singleness. If you're unmarried and wanted to be married, you can pray about that. You can look for a suitable marriage partner. Those things are okay to do. Or if you're chronically ill, it's okay to pray for healing, to seek to be well. But don't fall into the trap as you do that of thinking, I'm not going to be a true, good, full Christian until that thing happens. You see how it can happen? I can't be a proper Christian until I'm married, some people think. I can't be a full Christian until I'm well. If you're thinking in that way, then you don't, you kind of put your life on hold in a way. And you don't give yourself to living the Christian life in the place that God has called you right now. With all the opportunities and the limitations that that brings. Secondly, think about this. I think one of the applications of these verses is to be content in the situation in which God has placed you. We do that by reflecting on the, the goodness of God to us. He has called us. He has saved us. He has freed us. He has brought us into his service. And so we are content in the situation in which we are. And so come back to the example we were thinking before. You're praying for your freedom as a slave. You're working for your freedom as a slave. You're praying for a marriage partner. You're, you're praying about your illness. You're, you're praying and working for some other things that maybe you're discontent with in your life. It's okay to pray for those things, but, but how much of your life are you giving to it? So does that thing occupy 80% of your prayer life? Is it occupying kind of 80% of your, your thinking and your actions? Is that appropriate? Or does it reflect that you really do think that your life as a Christian is missing something because of the place that you are at the moment? Maybe that's something to reflect on. How much of my time and effort and thinking and prayer do I put into trying to change rather than trying to live as a Christian now? And thirdly, the situation that God has called you at this time might limit what you can do in various situations. Now these verses, they don't, they don't offer us a rule to live by. I was chatting to somebody the other night and I was saying, no, we, we love rules, don't we? I quite like being told, don't do this and do this. And it's very obvious what the don't do is and what the do is. But often the Christian life is just not like that, is it? And these verses are not like that. We are all different. God has called us to different places. And so we live our Christian life in those places, but there will be differences. Now, I think of one of my, one of my friends, Nigel. Um, I was in church with Nigel for a, a number of uh, years. I, I, wished, I wished for a long time I was like Nigel. He just seemed to have a boundless and endless energy and capacity to do whatever he wanted in whatever way he wanted. He just seemed to do everything. And he did loads and loads and loads. He served God in so many uh, different ways with a great capacity uh, to do that. And you know, it's tempting to when I was wanting to be like Nigel, to think, 
That's what a good Christian is like. That's what real Christian service is like, having boundless energy and capacity to take on all those uh, projects, to be able to do everything all the time and never stop. And that's what being a true Christian is like. But it's not. It was for Nigel in the place that God had called him. But it's not true for everyone. And so this passage should provide comfort and an acceptance and a contentment with the place that God has called us. Again, there's, there's, there's no rules, because on the one hand, on the one hand, this passage is a, a, a challenge to us. Live the Christian life now in the place where you are. Don't put serving Christ on hold. And it might be that you look back and think, if only, if only I hadn't done, I would, I would be serving God so much better now. Or you're looking it forward and thinking, if only I had that, then I'd be able to serve God better now. And the result is you, you don't fully live the Christian life now. It's a challenge for you to look at your life and think, am I serving Christ now with all that I have? Or are you looking back and thinking, oh, that mistake, it's, it's, it's stopped me serving now. And you're looking forward and saying, well, I'll, I'll serve when that happens. I'm waiting, and you're waiting to finish school. Because when you finish school and go to university, then you can serve God. I'm waiting to finish exams because the exams are stressful and they're important. And I'll serve God when I'm finished. I'm waiting to get the promotion. I'm working hard. When I get the promotion, then life will be a bit easier. I'm waiting till the children leave home. I'm, I'm waiting till I feel better. I'm waiting till I can get better control of my life. I'm waiting. You see, it's easy, isn't it, to do that? And not live the Christian life that God has given you now. So take some time to think, am I living the Christian life that God has called me to? In the place where I am. <laughs> Live it now. Take seriously the life which God has given you now and live it out in the way that you are called to do. But on the other hand, there is, should be real comfort for us here this morning as well. Because it might be that you are, you are limited in various ways. But that doesn't mean that you're not living the Christian life well. You might not be like my friend Nigel, who just seemed to go and go and go and go and go. And you can't do that. That's okay. Live the Christian life now with the limitations God has placed on you before Him. Now that He's not thinking that well, you should be doing, you should be doing everything. No, He accepts you. He welcomes you. He's called you, and you can live the Christian life in that situation. Remember, the God of the universe sent his son to die for you. And so you live now knowing that your future is secure. He's done everything to save you, to make you his child. And as we live that life, it's not about earning his favour, but to the light and the call he's given to us at this particular time. And as I say, there's loads more, I think, that I could and maybe probably should have said. Um, but hopefully there can be lots of discussion that you can have um, amongst each other as well, think about how that might uh, apply uh, to you. Your work is alive to all who hear and obey. Your word endures forever.